the Greeks, Alexander the Great, overran the known world at that time in, in a way that was just amazing. Nobody could stop him. And one of the ways that God accomplished something very critical for us to have the New Testament today happened because of the Greeks. Because not only did the Greeks overrun politically, they influenced culturally and most importantly made the Greek language the language of the world. The language of the known world of that, of that time from Europe to Asia to Northern Africa. So that by the time of Jesus, if you wrote something that everyone within the Roman Empire could read, you'd write it in Greek. Thus, our entire New Testament is written in Greek. The Greeks began what the Romans completed, which was this tremendous road building so that today you can find parts of the Roman roads that were built 2,000 years ago. And some of them are actually still used. So that by the time of Christ and by the time of the church, not only was there a language that no matter where Paul or John or Peter went, people could understand if they spoke Greek, they could get there because of the road system. You see, God uses and God provides the means for His will to take place. Sometimes supernaturally, more often naturally, providentially. And I believe that's the best way to understand the book of Esther. It's speaking of God's providence. Of God's providence. And it's a pretty cool story. A anybody watch the, the movie that was out a couple years ago? It was it One Night with the King or something? A few people there. It's, it's the story of this book. And if I remember, I don't remember it very well, but it's it's fairly true to the to the book as I recall. Yeah. So let's pick it up if you've made your way to the book of Esther. And we're going to start in chapter one. And this is the setup of the whole story. Came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. Now Ahasuerus was his title. His name was Xerxes. Ahasuerus was his title. This was the Ahasuerus who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. He's got a big, big empire. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel, that in the third year of his reign, he made a feast for all his officials and servants, the powers of Persia and, Med and Medea, the nobles, the princes of the provinces being before him. And when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many days, 180 days in all. This is one big party, let me tell you. But there's actually more to it that the scripture doesn't tell us. At this time, Ahasuerus, Xerxes, was trying to um, consolidate his power and he is going to go and he is going to attack the Greeks in their territory. He's going to go and attack them. And it didn't turn out well for them. They lost. But he's gathering them all together to kind of get them all charged up and convinced to follow me. I've got a great empire and we're going to go. So when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and all his stuff for 180 days, and it says, and when these days were completed, the king made a feast lasting seven days for all the people who were present in Shushan, the citadel, from great to small in the court of the garden of the king's palace. And there were white and blue linens curtains fastened with cords of fine linen and purple and silver rods and marble pillars and the couches were of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of alabaster turquoise and white and black marble it's quite extravagant and they served drinks in golden vessels each vessel being different from the other with royal wine in abundance according to the generosity of the king in accordance with the law the drinking was not compulsory for so the king had ordered all the officers of his household that they should do according to each man's pleasure. In other words, everybody can drink however much they want. And they don't even have to drink if they don't want to. And they get the king's wine. This is one big party. Queen Vashti also made a feast for the women in the royal palace, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. Now, this is typical in those days, and it's not untypical in the Middle Eastern culture today where men and women are separated. And the women would not come to such a feast gathering and so forth, especially the time when it was just the nobles and the generals and stuff. And then afterwards, no, this is for the men. 
my friend Pastor Skip Heitzig talked about when he went to, I'm um, trying to remember where he went in the Middle East, which country it was. Um, it was I, He didn't say the country, it was probably Jordan, and he spent the day with uh, with the Bedouins, with an actual you know Bedouin tribe and so forth. And he said he went and uh, went into the tent, and here's all the guys, and some of them are sleeping, and some of them are drinking coffee, and that's pretty much what they did all day. And it was the women who were out and plowing the fields and taking care of the camel and taking care of the business of the day. That's the way it was in the culture in those days. It's the way it is in some of the cultures in the Middle East to this day. And so the queen's got her party. The king's got his party going on. It says, On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded all these guys, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king, wearing her royal crown in order to show her beauty to the people and the officials, because she was beautiful. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command brought by his eunuchs. Therefore, the king was furious. His anger burned within him. Who does she think she is? And we find in the rest of the, of the chapter, basically his servants and his guys around said, King, you can't let this one pass, man. You let her get away with this, and now our wives are going to be a problem. Every woman in the kingdom is going to be saying, well, I don't feel like doing that. So I won't. And so the king decreed, look in verse 20, the king's decree, which he will make is proclaimed throughout all his empire, for it is great. All wives will honor their husbands, both great and small. These guys were scared. And the reply pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Memucan. And he sent letters to all the king's provinces, to each province in his own script, and to every people in his own language, that each man should be master in his own house and speak in the language of his own people. Yeah. And what the king did is very important. He put his seal on this. Now, in the Persian culture, when the king made a decree that was formalized by his seal, it could not be reversed. It could not. Once that law was passed, that was it. That was law and stayed law. The king couldn't even reverse it, which is very interesting when we get to a later spot in this story. So, chapter 2 starts with, after these things. What we find as we, as we examine a little closer the timeline involved here, after these things doesn't mean the next day. This means some years later, and actually what happened in the meantime was Xerxes' unsuccessful attempt to put down the Greek Empire and went, fought, and ended up coming back defeated. And now he comes back. He's been defeated. He's still got his empire. He wasn't able to go to Greece and, and stop the Greeks. Now he comes back. He's still got his empire, but he knows the Greeks are coming. And he doesn't even have a wife. He's pretty bummed out. And when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done, and what had been decreed against her. And then the king's servants who attended him said, uh, let beautiful young women be sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of the kingdom that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan, the citadel, into the women's quarters under the custody of of Haggai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women, and let beauty preparations be given them. And it goes on, and basically this is the first biblical recorded, I think the only biblical recorded, beauty pageant. It's what it was. And basically they said, let's go through all the kingdom, let's find all the beautiful young women, let's have them come, and we'll take a year to prepare them for you. Six months worth of being rubbed with oils. And then another six months of being bathed in perfumes. And then each one will be brought for one night to the king. And whoever you choose, that gets to be your new queen. And it says, Xerxes liked this idea. Are we surprised? No, I'm not. Sounds like a pretty male kind of thing to do, doesn't it? <laughs> 